Hey guys, Dave the Pain Train Mazzani here, and you are watching Loudmouth Presents Off the Top Rope. Yeah, go ahead and tune in and enjoy it. It's going to be fun. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we have got such a treat for you. We have got a living legend in the combat world, two-time EFC lightweight champion, professional wrestler, fitness guru, uh, Las Vegas's proud, proud son, Dave, the pain train, Mazzani. Dave, how are you, sir? I'm not too bad. Um... Yeah, Las Vegas is proud son. I'm actually from Alaska, so but I've been here for about a de over a decade, so I'm 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 a Las Vegas person these days. Well, they, but it's weird hearing that. It's, it's you're you're a, you're a naturalized citizen of Las Vegas now. They probably will claim you as their as their own uh, after being there for for a decade. Yeah, I think so. I think I'm a Las Vegas guy these days, but I miss the Alaska stuff. <laughs> Is 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 it the is it the peace and quiet that Alaska gives you, or is it um, just just the fact that it's a, a totally different world to to what Las Vegas is? It, it uh, what what Alaska gave me it was it was a little bit of a sense of adventure. Um, it's like uh, a sense of adversity, right? Because it's mm -hmm. snowy, it's cold, it's crappy, and uh, there's like a lot more rugged people than there are in Vegas and I, and I can appreciate it. And I really enjoy that right. um, outdoor stuff and everything. Now that I'm retired from fighting, like I'm able to go out and do things. It's fun. Like I used to fish and hunt and camp and all kinds of stuff in Alaska. And, and since I've been retired, I'm able to start exploring that and exploring life and where it takes me. Sure. Sure. Let, let's, let's, let's talk about your time uh in the efc as champion you you going back in your 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 combat career you you suffered a few losses in a row i think it was three losses in a row was there a point in time where you thought you know maybe getting hit in the face isn't exactly for me yeah well that was that was told to me quite a bit um mm -hmm. it was weird i had this burning desire because when i was in alaska yeah I'd, I, I wasn't getting the best training. There wasn't any type of management. I didn't even know what, what managers did or why someone would want to manage a career. Um, hindsight, you know, if you pad your record a little bit, you can go further, go quicker. Um, sure. And so, um, you know, but, but in Alaska, I was matched up with some, you know, very bad matchups. Uh, you know, well, the first one was good. It was a main event for like, it's a local guy, Josh Henry. It, I took a loss there and it was a went down to a decision. I took an even harder fight against a guy named Claude Patrick, who, if you look him up, he had a stint in the UFC and was very solid um, grappler. Um, and then I stepped up even more and, and, and got this guy uh, called named Ryan Ford, who's probably mm -hmm. arguably tougher than both those guys. Um, so I just fought tougher opponents and that, that Ryan Ford fight gave me a, an orbital fracture, broken nose. My teeth are still numb from that, that wow. kick to the face. Um, you know, bones were as a compound fracture, bones are coming out of the bridge of my nose. And, you know, we don't, we don't have any type of socialized healthcare. So it all came out of my pocket because I didn't have insurance. Couldn't, you know, yeah, it just yeah. wasn't a thing. Um, so I had a 15,000 American dollars or so at a, figure out how to pay eventually and then and then after i paid that out off and saved some some money mm -hmm. then i went to vegas to really pursue it and and like you said i was gun shy and especially going to vandalay silva's gym right away yeah, i was yeah. gun shy um because my face was previously broken but there was always this burning desire that i was meant for greatness and meant for something better and i felt that the um mma world was the Ops was the thing to do that the catalyst to, to bring right. great into my life right and then, and then in between all of that then you got the call from from uh, south africa to come and join the efc uh was was it was that something you you had to think about or was it uh hi dave we want you to come to south africa uh the answer is yes you know it was one of those decisions where it was automatic well 
it was one of those things that like I was I was doing nothing but training in Vegas uh, at Vandalay Silva's gym. Um, Vinzel Nil, the current champion, mm-hmm. was going to fight Chris Bright, who was you know who got injured before the fight. Yeah, and um, I was I was going to replace him, but I basically got ten days notice, and it was the first time I, I cut to 160 pounds instead of 155 pounds, um, which I don't know if that is in kilos, but whatever uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll do the conversion it was, later we'll it was later. like a two kilo difference right like yeah. two kilos up from from lightweight is, is basically where we met and uh but it was my first time cutting weight it was it was on 10 days notice i took the fight because we were in a recession and fights weren't really happening yeah like there yeah. were there are few and far between you know um especially for a journeyman fighter who's coming off of three losses that you know whatever but um uh so I just said, yeah. And I cut the weight and I threw my back out real bad before that fight, like literally right before the 30 hour trip to uh, South Africa. Yeah. Um, I threw my back out. It was, it was, it was a crazy time, like learning how to cut, learning how to do all this stuff um, again. And then I took, took out the win and then uh, didn't get invited back to, to, to they, they didn't bring international people in for a while but once they started doing it you better believe they brought in the pain train yeah that's yeah. it uh, how was your how was your your experience in south africa because uh you know I, I interview a lot of wrestlers that come from overseas to south africa and it's it's not a culture shock per se but it's a different south africa is a different a different uh, a different mentality uh, when it can, when when people come from overseas, so so how was your experience dealing with South Africa and the South African culture and the South African people? Um, South Africa was all. I mean, I always really enjoyed South Africa. I guess I was always felt welcome, and and it, it was it's one of my favorite. You know, one of my favorite places. Some place I want to come back to one way or another. Before quarantine, I was supposed to get a professional wrestling match yeah, in yeah. South Africa. And then they quarantine us and, you know, it just wasn't happening, but um, it, it's a place I definitely want to go back again. Um, uh, so many things about it. And I spent a lot of time in Cape town and how can you not enjoy um, <laughs> Cape town? Yeah. Yeah. So, it, and you know, um, I, sorry, sorry to interrupt there. And uh, uh, when you, when you looked at the fight, we'll, we'll touch on the professional wrestling side, side of it. Now I just want to ask this last question. In terms of the talent that EFC was was, was putting out and, and that the, the 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 quality of opponent that you had, how does it rank uh, in terms of international standards, if you will? I mean, uh, like initially when I fought, I is it you know I watched the first EFC events and I participated. In, I think EFC EFC five. Yeah. Um, I didn't see very high level, right? I saw a lot of, like big holes in the game with wrestling and and K and K and wall work and jujitsu mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And um, but then as time went by, uh, and you know, I started coming in and whatever, you know, it, there there was very challenging fights, you know, and I, I think the level was pretty good. And you're seeing it, you know, uh, you know, guys from the EFC are, are making it to the UFC. I, I just ran into champion dolce the other day he was over yeah. in uh at extreme couture i was okay. i was like i was doing some pull-ups you know i'm, not, I'm just i'm not i'm not really I've, I've gotten i'm mad every once in a while but i'm just kind of lifting staying in shape but uh doing some pull-ups and this dude is looking at me i'm like holy shit you know it, it was cool to see a familiar face and and uh he was hanging out with francis nagano who's fighting for the title real soon but uh, yeah yeah it's 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 really cool to see him, uh, you know, in my, in my home. And, awesome. and uh, awesome. yeah, so, so, I don't know, the whole thing's great. I, I, I miss South Africa a lot. All right. So, so let's talk about the professional wrestling, wrestling side of it. Now, how did that, how did that fit into, into your, your, your combat, your combat skill, shall we say? Well, I was always a fan of pro pro wrestling. I grew up in the attitude era, you know, with stone cold, Steve Austin. Well, like earlier, like, you know, when I was a little, little, little kid, it was Hulk Hogan and macho man and, and dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair, that, that, that whole crew. Yeah, um, yeah. And then it took a little time off of pro wrestling, you know, just, just stopped watching it. And then I watched it later on with the attitude, Eric, with the rock, with stone cold, Steve Austin, you know, a little bit of the older Shawn Michaels, Mick Foley, all those guys, you know? Yeah. Um, 
so and then, then my but my brother guy at school we started a backyard wrestling fed you know we built a ring there's a ring built in the backyard and we could run ropes and that's a little bit of suspension we could do spots and uh, we had a legit program that we started running with the local fed in uh in Anchorage, you know, mm-hmm. I, I ref a lot of matches, but I would train and be involved. And, and then as my fight career progressed, I, you know, I, I, after high school, I went to college, came back, started my fight career. And then but before I was moving to Vegas, um, I got booked for a couple of matches at the Alaska State Fair. And those are my first official matches, like matches, matches, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so then, uh, and I actually wrestled that guy. We had a backyard wrestling federation with the state fair. Mm-hmm. And then later on, then I stopped wrestling. Uh, that same guy that I wrestled that I went to high school with ended up being in Las Vegas. And he was this, 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 uh, he was wrestling with at future stars of wrestling. I popped in every once in a while, checked it out, but uh, it wasn't until I had a conversation with Josh Barnett. If you guys know Josh Barnett, yeah, yeah, a yeah. big pride fighting veteran, UFC veteran. He, at, at the time he was the youngest champion um ever and maybe the i think it might have been the youngest still the youngest heavyweight ever yes. um he, he did pancreas in japan but he's also a big pro wrestling guy um and and right now he's doing a really cool promotion that i'm that, you know i'm trying to get on is uh uh it's called blood sport right and yeah it's like yeah it's an mma style pro wrestling thing really cool really awesome concept and, and i think it's blowing up but uh but josh was telling me he's like yeah, like because he came in town I, and i knew this coffee shop that had a cool nitro brew like nitro <laughs> nitrous oxide and stuff and he he nerds out over things like that he's like oh man where's this nitro brew i was like let's get some coffee and so we, we met and got coffee and we we're talking i know josh from my sister she trained in uh seattle and josh barnett was like a pacific northwest seattle yeah, guy yeah. um here in vegas so like we got connected through that it's just random but so we're having coffee and he was like dude why'd you stop working pro wrestling and i was like i, you know, I don't know just just focusing on fighting he's like well in his opinion pro wrestling would help fighting and there's a lot of truth to that um mm-hmm. it allowed it allows a little more ring awareness and stuff like that so then i started training and you know, doing shows in between fights. And, and he was true. It was true. Like I started to be able to hear my corner a little bit better. I was aware of my surroundings There's small details in a fight. If you look at most of my EFC fights, you can see that I purposely angle myself and took my opponent down in my corner. Yeah. There's a lot of fights where my guys in my corner, because I chose to steer them that way. And that's just wing ring awareness. You only get that through fights See, here's the thing. People train in a gym, a comfortable situation. And then when you go to fight, there's lights on you. There's a curtain, there's music, there's a crowd, there's all these unfamiliar faces. And so pro wrestling allows you to sort of get, get used to that. Also gets used to things like this, like, a, like an interview, because at the end of the day, uh, mixed martial arts is entertainment. I mean, I know some bad mofos, but you know, they can't get booked. I mean, I, I arguably, I was really, really good. And I just think I just didn't uh, manage myself correctly and get developed correctly. If I had, if I could train for, could have trained full time in it and had, you know, a proper coach right from the beginning, you know, I had a good coach, but if I had like coach and had it all serious, you know, because, you know, I was steered the right, I, I just wanted to fight, you know, and yeah. I didn't know what I was doing, but if I had that, I could have been a lot better, but, uh, sure. Sure. but at the end of the day, there's a lot of people who can't talk and can't, do an interview or express themselves. It's, and it's at the end of the day, it's not that you're not interesting, but you're not willing to share what makes you interesting, right? Like you don't know how to communicate it. Cause I think everybody has a story. Everybody's interesting, but just communicating it to the audience is the, is the craft. Yeah. There is, you see, there, there's a, there's subtle nuances to professional wrestling that if you look at a guy from MMA and I'm not, I'm not knocking guys from, from MMA at all, but the, the, they frown on professional wrestling, but now MMA is doing professional wrestling things. The interviews, the stare downs, yeah. the trash talking, you know, there, there's, there's little parts of it coming in and you can tell when guys are sharper with presenting themselves better because those are the guys that are good at interviews. They, they, they give snappy comebacks. They're always in front of the camera. They're always aware 
of where cameras are and you don't get you don't get that like you say you don't get that from a from from an mma gym you get that from a professional wrestling background so you know it's it's subtle nuances uh if you want to compare it it's like making it it's like making a gourmet dish you can't just put a, a chicken breast on a plate and present it as gourmet you got to add right. the spices to it and so sometimes mma doesn't teach you the spice i want to talk about the claw the claw now that's yeah. that's a that's a that's a that's an old school a really really old school finishing move baron von raschke used the claw um the the von erics used the claw uh, it's a it's a very it's a uh, it's a protected move in professional wrestling um how did you come about using the claw well my brother and I, we, we, we like, we just thought it was a cool submission when we were younger. And there's pictures of us in high school doing this. Mm -hmm. Like, just thought it was cool, you know? Okay. So at the end of the day, that, that's what it was originally. And then, so even when I pro wrestled, like when I was younger and my, my, uh, you know, in, in my younger day, I didn't, I didn't do it, you know? And <laughs> but it wasn't until I came to Vegas. Well, after, the first time the claw came out was the first EFC fight against Vince O'Neill. Yeah. I thought like, I was so excited and I always thought it would be cool to like put a face on and like look into a camera and do the claw after a fight. I just thought it would be cool. And, and, and I did it and I got the dopest photo from that. And I was like, that, that's it. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. And then, so it, it's because like at the end of the day so again a entertaining psychology whatever is if you want to get like sometimes you gotta like do something or have like a gimmick to get over like hey uh who'd you what, what, what fight did you like oh that 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 bald white guy well shit there's a lot of us you know yeah. like what's yeah. gonna separate this bald muscular white guy from the other you know and oh the guy that does the this thing oh cool you know like remember like rampage he had rampage jackson had the chain he yeah, was like yeah. owl and stuff and then chuck liddell did the zions gimmick with his hands after yeah. and then uh, uh tito ortiz did the, does a shovel thing you know they they all have you know you start to pick up these little gimmicks even old school like um and he was a pro wrestler and actually I, he was on the same show as me at, in the past which is crazy but dan severin had the uh had the sweaty gray shirt sweaty gray shirt gimmick all the time and it became yeah. like a thing like, oh that guy with the sweaty gray shirt so you need like a look you need like a thing to to get over i think in a lot of mm -hmm. ways so so i just adopted that and then when i started pro wrestling it was logical because i started making this thing this a thing in mma it's logical to use it in pro wrestling but also i was trying to protect my body when i do a pro wrestling match especially when i was fighting i didn't do any risky maneuvers i told a story with the iron claw yeah and yeah. it's a finisher that doesn't put any risk to me and it doesn't put any risk to my opponent you know um if I'm, if I'm going to break out of kayfabe here for a second, <laughs> but um, yeah, and that, that's why, that's another reason why it made a lot of sense for me. Yeah. And, and it was great because at, at that time, during um, the EFC time, there, there wasn't any, there wasn't any characters. Everybody, everybody stood for their promo photos. I stood like this. Yeah. And it was, uh, I'd use the term vanilla. Because yeah. now guys are doing things, you know, the, the, the guys from Africa are proud of their flags, are bringing their flags and things like that. So a lot of the guys were very, I use the term vanilla in, in quotation fingers, but they were. They were vanilla. They didn't have any character. Um, they, they, you know, everybody wanted to be the tough guy, which yeah. is fine. It's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough organization. Everybody wanted to be the tough guy. Well, there was at, no character. at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and, and, you know, EFC did a really good job. They coached a lot of people to find their thing, you know, find mm -hmm. their, their character, you know, even, you know, they, they encourage you to, to, to come out with your flag and, you know, hey, do something, express yourself a little bit. So I think they did do a good job bringing that out. Um, you know, it's, it's fun to be the tough guy. And like I said, all of us are tough guys. So it's not like I'm, I got to be a special tough guy in Man, some way, shape or form, right? <laughs> all right. The nickname, the pain train. Yeah. <laughs> now I try. I try to look up the origin of this, 
the pain train. So obviously I went to the, the EFC web, website and it says, if you want to know, ask me. So I'm sad? asking, what is with the pain train? The nickname, the pain train. Well, so I was, uh, so way back in the day when I was in college, I graduated 06. So this must have been 04, 05, around there, right? Um, mm -hmm. There was this internet commercial that was going around from Reebok and it was Terry Tate, the office linebacker and, um, you know, big giant linebackers in American yeah. football smashing into each other. And, and um, so he would go in the office. He's a big, big black dude and he was muscular and he had like somebody would be late for work and he would tackle him. And, you know, he was doing all kinds of stuff, but there's this part where this guy threw a, a, an aluminum can into the uh, trash and not the recycle bin. And he goes, what's up with that, Leonard? What's up with that? Come on, the pain train's coming, the pain train's coming, woo, 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 woo. And he like, he goes, sorry, Terry. And then, and then he puts the thing in the right thing. So check out that commercial, it's hilarious. Um, but I was a collegiate track and field athlete. And at the time I was training for the decathlon. So mm -hmm. the decathlon, we trained like uh, 400, 400 meter runners basically. And yeah. so like a little bit of a sprint, a little bit of endurance, but you're like working a lot of lactic threshold when you are trained that way. And so we'd run these like ridiculous workouts where I'd probably puke about once a week, e easy uh, from a workout or, uh, or, a, or a meet. But when I would do like, especially an indoor meet, because I couldn't run anywhere. And when I was running, you know, you have the indoor 200 meter track. Yes, yes. Um, I would run like a four or an eight and uh, I would get done and, and my teammates would walk around and go, the pain train's coming, the pain train's coming. I'm like, and I'm a loud puker. That's a thing. I, ah, ah. I'm like, you make this loud puke. And so uh, it kind of stuck a little bit there, you know, and then when I started fighting, I was like, well, be the pain train. I, I like that. <laughs> Cause the pain train to me was like, it, it had a degree of, uh, of silliness and, and goofiness mm -hmm. not you know being serious but it also like implies eh, that that's actually something that could be badass right like the yeah, pain yeah. train i'm gonna bring the pain and, and whatever like but it, but it has a mixture of two and it and for me it encompassed my personality like i'll laugh with you and punch you in the face the next day and like you know what i mean it's 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 what we do we yeah, i enjoy yeah. what i do i enjoy the pain i enjoy the grind and the, and the, and the hardship and all that stuff. I enjoy all that. So why not be the pain train, you know? <laughs> yeah. That, and, and also, you know, it, it also kind of matched your fighting style because you, you, you weren't the type of, you weren't the type of fighter that would stand back and wait for the opponent. You'd always be coming forward. You'd always, you'd always get the guy into the position where you want him. So, you know, later on, you know, watching the pain train and just watching how you moved in the ring, it actually made made more sense. Um, you know, you started off, it was a, you know, a kind of a, an, an in joke and a bit of a rib, but, you know, towards the, you know, when, when you were, when you were the champion, it, it really was your fighting style because you really put the guys where you wanted them at any time. And, you know, we kind of matched up later. I have to admit though, um, I did bet on your fights. You did make me a. You did make me a. You did make me a bit of money. So you know, uh, I thank you for that one. I'm going to put it out there right now. So you know, you made me. You made me a bit of money. It's it's so weird when I when I heard that like people would I would walk up to somebody and they said they bet on me. I'm like, wow, that's that's really weird, man. <laughs> Don't bet on me. <laughs> like like you know, especially when it's somebody telling me they bet their paycheck and I better win or something like that. I'm like, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> hey, look, look I, only, I only bet 50 bucks on you, but I made my money back. So it's fun. You know, I didn't bet that. I didn't hey. bet the house. I just, you know, had what was in my wallet. So don't take offense to that. But, you know, yeah. also, you know, thank you very much. You made my wallet very fat that day. Let's are you you still you still training your sister, correct? I, sh I you know, I should have done. I should have started betting on myself. Sometimes. I work with her a little bit, not, not a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more these days, like the emotional support. She's actually uh, moved to a different state. She's at James Krause's gym in, in Kansas okay. city. Um, what's, what's her gym called? I, I was for the gym, but it's where Tim Elliott started and mm -hmm. Tim Elliott's her fiance and, and you know, the, 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 their, their kid's mom is there, they're, you know, and, and the, before the kid was here, 
um the kid but they wanted to be over there and and also like james krauss has worked uh magic for my sister lately and she needs a lot of attention a lot of like tlc and i couldn't give it to her towards the end of my career and and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh it, she struggled you know with stuff and and, and then she got you know uh to, to james krauss's gym and, and they, they're they're doing it well so I'm, I'm really really happy for her. she's getting you know she won her last fight in the ufc and did really good so it was awesome if you had to now i'm not talking about i'm not talking about you know playing around like like brother and sister do you know you play around and you you fight a little bit and you you scrap and things like that who would actually win in if, if you if you had to if you had to i'm not going to say fight for your life but if, if you had to fight for for a sizable prize and you had to get into the ring and fight your sister do you think you'd beat her yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely um i mean like we gotta face it you know like one she's not a she, you know i'm a lot bigger i got mm -hmm. man strength um you know her skill set's getting pretty good but it just you know uh, I, yeah <laughs> well and, you know they, they, and it, 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 we've been training about the same amount of time and now her skill set's probably getting pretty even because she her and i trained at the same time she took a lot of time off I train a lot. Mm -hmm. She came to Vegas, increased a little bit. And now she's like training a lot. So it's kind of like maybe we're even skills wise now, but I mean, big brothers always win. And, and, uh, okay. Fair, fair. You, you don't have to be a tough guy. For you. you don't have to be What's a tough that? guy for the recording. I'm just, you know, I just put it out there. I just, <laughs> we're just mentioning it on the side. But we usually team up. We're usually friends. And she's, you know, she's been my tag partner in pro wrestling. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're on the same side, luckily. <laughs> luckily, luckily. They, they got, you know, they, there's, there's this thing now called feminist strength. You know, you just tell them to make a sandwich or get into the kitchen or something like that. They look stronger than they look if you if you mention things like that. So, you know, just oh. <laughs> put it, just, you know, space bag that, well, that bit of information, just put it aside, don't mention it. No, no. <laughs> if people, people that obviously follow you on... Um, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and things like that. We'll see your fitness videos on right. um, on any of your social media. And those those workouts, man, they look they look absolutely killer. Uh, is that where is that where your your later career is going into into now the the, the fitness part of it? Yeah, I mean, my degree was in human performance and physical education mm -hmm. uh, with a minor in coaching, and I dabbled in the coaching after I graduated. I I, I coached uh high school track and field high school cross country running and high school ice hockey mm -hmm. all as head coaches at 25 you know <laughs> did that for about three years sure. um and then when i was in vegas i was just doing personal training and stuff to pay my bills while i uh um got through my fight career and and, and as of recent i, I started really dabbling into the group fitness, you know, with the microphone and, and, and we, we do hot fit, you know, I was doing hot fitness for a while and, yeah. and you know, regular temperature fitness, but we, you know, I, I was, uh, I, I recently quit that job, but I, uh, was working for a franchise and I was a travel team fitness director to where I would travel around and help them open up franchise and help educate the instructors on how to teach the modalities that they teach. And, and so I was teaching, I was actively teaching a, a hot Pilates class, a hot barefoot boot camp, which is like a, a, a hot room with humidity, with kettlebells and all kinds of stuff. Um, a hot bar class, ballet based, right? Where you have right. a bar on the wall and yeah, you yeah. pulse your leg up brutal um like real a lot of music beat driven stuff and dancey things that i gotta like pick up um i taught a true you know a, a, a non-heated kettlebell class a class that was all trx straps um battle ropes and battle yeah. ropes kettlebells um i helped them design their boxing their cardio boxing program which included kettlebells and stuff like that um and i also did a did a uh 200 hour yoga certification so i was teaching uh, a hatha series for them as well so okay. um, i was a, mi I'm a mixed martial artist of the uh the fitness 
<laughs> so, you know, because I also do Olympic lifting and I worked for them, you know, I worked, did CrossFit stuff and, you know, I like power lifting. I like seeing how heavy I can squat and deadlift. Yeah. And I see always my shoulders. <laughs> and I see a lot of exercises with the kettlebell. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Those things are the devil. I'm going to put it out there. Those yeah. things are the devil. Whoever invented kettlebells, I hope they get a cramp in their left foot because those things are brutal. Right. They are absolutely brutal. I look at, I look at the kettlebells in the, in, in the gym and we kind of size each other up. Uh, mm -hmm. I look at them and they look at me and, you know, we kind of go our separate ways. Uh, I can't yeah. stand those things, man. And every time I see you in a workout, man, it's got kettlebells in it. And I'm like, oh. yeah. And well, then there's the, tur and there's the, 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 the Turkish, the Turkish, get up yep. with my girlfriend you see that oh man i look at the, <laughs> i look at those things and i look at that kettlebell i'm like not yeah for me. not for me well i got turned on to kettlebells when i saw a picture of fedor emilianenko who's like a big champion of yeah of pride right is a picture of him he's like in spandex shorts with his dad bod but like this and he's got like kettlebells around him and i'm like oh because because if you guys remember like Fedor was like one of the most explosive dynamic heavyweights yeah, um, yeah. ever. He was the king for a long time. And, and uh, you know, the Russians started with the kettlebell. So I was like, I was like, I want to get my hands on those things. They made Fedor strong. It's made me strong. It wasn't until I got to Vegas that I uh, started being able to work with them. I think I did a little bit in a CrossFit gym in Alaska, but um, yeah. Yeah, I did a little bit in a CrossFit gym in Alaska, but, but they're, they're, they're cool. And now, as of now, I, I made a big investment. I bought 47 kettlebells, like a, a bunch of them, because wow. here's the thing about a kettlebell. That's nice. They're compact. Mm -hmm. Like I can carry enough equipment in a small space to a location and give people workout. Yeah. Also, I can pack a room with kettlebells. Like if I had barbells, it takes all this space up, but with a kettlebell, I can train you within the yoga mat space. So imagine how many people I can get in a room. Now COVID crap is happening. So it's a little bit more difficult for that model. But um, at the end of the day of some, but also like, I looked at it this way too. Like I grew up in the construction trades around there and, and a carpenter always has his saw and his hammer and his, the plumber has his wrenches. Well, a fitness enthusiast, a fitness person should be investing in equipment and tools. We essentially rent it from people all the time. I go to a gym, I pay rent, I train people that way. Well, I need to have my own thing, you know, and, right. and it just, I'm just working on building my brand somewhere else. I'm, you know, I got my, I went my, I did my MMA run. Now I need to find my new championship. I, I, I want to make, I want to build a business and I want to make myself successful um, to the point where I can like buy or have a retirement and live sure. comfortably, sure. whatever. Right? I'm still, so I'm back in that MMA grind right now, baby. Like It's just what it is. But you guys should check out the, the, the videos on Instagram because they're really cool. If you, you can learn something and I'm going to branch off and do some good things with it. But right now that's free information for you. And I feel, I feel like it's, it's explained better than most. So um, well, give it a check, check it out with the, with the COVID thing. Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it, it's become a, a, a weekend warrior kind of thing, but there is, there is a, there is like this, this deluge of information that has come in from fitness. Guys are telling you to run, telling you not to run, telling you to do the, these power straps, telling you not to do power straps. You know, all this information is is there and it's readily available because now everybody's recording from home and and mm -hmm. things like that. If, if you had to take one person, say for example me, and yeah. give them your best fitness advice, not not free of charge, but just just between you and I, what would be the best fitness advice that you can give anybody well here's the thing people are always asking what the most ideal workout like what like what, what what's the best workout mm -hmm. and at the end of the day it's the workout that you'll do it's it's right. the workout right. that you'll do so figure out what kind of training you like to do 
and then branch off from there. And, and, and like, like, for example, there's people that really love yoga. They do all yoga, but they, you know, they aren't building mus mu enough muscle mass to enhance, get their metabolism going and lean out like they want yeah. to, or get strong. And, and so you take that yoga, you do, do a lot of yoga, but just add a little bit of stuff you hate, just a little tiny bit, dude, like lift once a week. You know, yeah, it's yeah. one, it's going to boost your yoga practice and another, it's going to like increase your metabolism because you like made the engines run hotter, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so that's the thing. So that's one, do the workout that you will do. Cause if I give you the, like this fancy plan and you don't do it, well, shit, like it's not going to do you anything. Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. So figuring that out. And then at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, don't eat like crap is, is, is the easy way to say it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's sugar. It's, it's added sugar is huge and, and processed carbohydrates. Like yeah. at the, if you just look at, if you, if you know exactly where that food came from and you can pronounce every ingredient, it's probably good for you. Right. If it isn't, right. it's probably bad for you. Protein with every fat and protein with every meal, um, you know, stuff like that. Sure, um, sure. And then, you know, just a little bit of multivitamin profiles and stuff like that is it will, will do a huge difference, but the workout that you'll do, don't eat like crap and, and, you know, just find us and, and what, but, but what, what diet is best? Well, again, it's the same thing. The one that yeah, you're willing yeah. to do, you know, like my mom, she lost a lot of weight on Weight Watchers. She loves Weight Watchers. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, 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 it has a really cool point system or whatever. And some people don't want to do that. Some people want to get really type A about it and weigh everything out. Okay, that that worked for you. Cool. That's sustainable for you. All right. You know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm able to feel things out, you know, like, oh, I, my body needs this. My body needs that. But that comes with you know, working on your diet and actually thinking and feeling what happened when you ingested whatever you ingested, you know, I, I feel like we, we have this really terrible habit of like, not even realizing why we feel the way we do. Like, oh, this is just how I feel. I just have heartburn. No, you ate like shit. <laughs> That's why you yeah, have heartburn. Yeah, yeah. You know, like it, like it, it's, it's like a weird sense of denial that mm -hmm. the, the, the whole saying you are what you eat. Uh, some people just don't realize that that's actually true. Yeah. 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 The pain train. What food that is bad for you that Dave cannot stay away from? It that rotated with every, like most fight camps it would rotate what I was craving. Um, I, I think a, a really consistent one would be a fresh cinnamon roll, right? If I, like right. In, in the, in the American airports for a long time, they had this franchise called Cinnabon. I don't know. Oh, yes. Oh, Cinnabon. yes. But I remember walking to, I remember flying out for a fight. And, you know, when, we're, when I'm fighting in the States or whatever, right? Like I'm already start, I'm like, oh, I'm done eating. I'm going to go fly on this flight, not eat yeah. anything, not drink anything. And I'll smell Cinnabon. <laughs> and I remember looking at it. I'm like, all right, you're mine. Like, I, like after this fight, you're going down Cinnabon. And sure enough, uh, my way back, I found it before I hit, I, I mean, I ate that cinnamon roll before I even got to the baggage claim right like, <laughs> i ate it while i was walking you know um so that's that's one um donuts are always a consistent one um i don't know why but uh panda express is like a chinese food yeah, yeah. Uh, franchise in america um Ch uh, panda express orange chicken was one for a while and right. after my right. sister fought in the UFC in Shanghai, China, that's the first place we went because like the real Chinese food sucked. <laughs> so, so we went and got a Bud Light and a you know Panda Express <laughs> and put it down on the on the air, airport layover in, in LA. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, I'm not gonna keep you much longer. Um, this has been a great interview. We we uh, this there is so much more to mine from your fight experience and professional wrestling and things like that. I want you, I'm putting you on the spot right now. Wrestling promo, three, two, one, go. <laughs> well, 
I've been traveling across the world from one place to the next. And what I notice, the thing that happens all the time is I get some jabroni stepping on the tracks. Mm -hmm. Stepping on the tracks where the pain train is coming. Because you know what happens? When you step on the tracks, the pain train is coming. It'll get you. I don't know. That was my best. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, don't don't eat like I, shit, brother. <laughs> don't eat like shit. Do some squats. Press some stuff. Woo! Lift some kettlebells. As a matter of fact, hold on a second. Hold on a second. What interview would not be complete without a 24 kilo kettlebell press, you know? Uh, there we go. Just oh. randomly. Put me to shit. How do you think I got the iron claws? It's bottoms up grip, you know, the bottoms up. 24 kilos right in front of my $1,000 computer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That ain't a promo. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm intimidated right down to my cotton socks. Dave, I want to thank you very much for your time, man. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, we would love to see you wrestle in South Africa. CPW Management, I know you're watching this because we have become the only CPW voice piece for the promotion. This is where you get your podcast from when you're in CPW. CPW, I know... Management, I know you're watching this. There is the pain train. Bring him to South Africa. Get him in the ring. All Africa champion. Loudmouth All Africa champion is waiting for the pain train. Dave, thank you very much for your time. We are going to speak further. We appreciate your time. The pain train. Loudmouth presents off the top rope. Uncensored, uncut, and definitely afraid of kettlebells. <laughs> Thanks Thank, for thank you very much, man. <laughs>